So, uh, as Murray mentioned, uh, today I'll be talking about uh, one aspect of work that our lab does on faithfulness and factuality. Uh, so, we have only around 25 minutes. Uh, so, it will be a brief version of different aspects about both modeling and evaluating faithful generation, uh, mostly in language, but then the last part of the talk uh, will touch upon some of the uh, work we've been doing in connecting it to multimodal summarization as well as text to image generation. Uh, which uh, you, I'm sure you're surrounded by in the last uh, one year of all these automatically generated images. Uh, so yeah, so the outline of the talk uh, is that uh, faithfulness is a key as, uh, okay, so my screen is moving automatically now. Uh, hmm. okay. Okay, so uh, yeah, so faithfulness uh, we'll discuss as a key aspect of accurate and trustworthy generation. And like I said, uh, okay, this is not. Uh, do you know, Murray, if this is a blue jeans thing? Like the screen moves forward automatically every three seconds. I've never seen this before. Uh, no, Mohit, this is not a blue jeans uh, issue, most probably. Okay, but this, I mean, the PowerPoint function doesn't do this. Uh, uh, Okay, so let me instead use the PDF then. But that, uh, I'm sorry. Anyway, I'll, I'll control it manually then, uh, but otherwise I'll use a PDF if it happens again. So yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, yeah, this is not going to, <laughs> so I'm basically it's not letting me speak for three seconds on a slide. So yeah, I'll skip the animation. Yeah, this is definitely something I've not seen before. So I'll use PDF. Okay, so you can see the PDF moving, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Wait, this is happening again. Uh, okay, I'll just keep this manually then and move here. And Does anyone know how to remove this part? Um, it's okay. Maybe you can keep that part, uh, Mahi. Okay, yeah, I'll just, yeah, I think I'll run out of time otherwise. Uh, anyway, so sorry about that. Uh, so I think uh, I'll just use this version. Uh, so yeah, as, the, as I was mentioning, the outline of the talk is that we'll be discussing faithfulness, which is a key aspect. Uh, especially these days when we are working with large scale pre-trained models and their downstream applications, we need to be uh, really careful about what kinds of hallucinations and uh, unfactual uh, information are they uh, outputting. Uh, so I'll cover the two first two aspects a little bit more deeply and then touch upon the last two multimodal connections more briefly. So the first thing we'll discuss is how to incorporate especially uh, into large scale pre-trained models for summarization, how do we holistically incorporate uh, the aspect of faithfulness both during pre-training and fine tuning. Uh, and then the second part, we'll discuss more on the evaluation side. Uh, how do we bring in uh, semantic graphs, things like abstract meaning representations and uh, more neurosymbolic approaches related to the topic of this workshop uh, for evaluating faithfulness and also a uh, discussion on how to automate uh, how to balance uh, human versus automation uh, when developing better metrics. And then the last two parts will be brief uh, in terms of how to connect this factuality issue in multimodal tasks uh, like multimodal summarization and text to image uh, generation. Uh, so yeah, so just a little bit of uh, an introduction on faithfulness issues. Uh, so we've all heard of the task of uh, document to summary generation, I'm sure. And the job of the model here is that given a document, for example, on the left, uh, which is truncated uh, in this case, uh, 
one output summary by a model can be something on the right, as you can see with my pointer, uh, that a Russian investigation is underway into the downing of a Russian warplane by Turkey on Saturday. So in this case, you can see that the model is, like the job of a summarization model is to do several things. One is consolidate salient, which is the important information from distinct parts of the document. So it's doing some of that. It also needs to make sure that the generated summary is fluent and grammatical. Uh, and it also needs to make sure that it's not generating some unseen uh, information and incorrect information that has no evidence, no support in the original input. So in this case, it's generating the word Saturday, which doesn't exist in the input document at all. Another task we can think of uh, with faithfulness issues would be things like image to text captioning. So the first example here is uh, something from a fine-grained captioning system uh, where it generates more detailed information like a couple of people playing with a frisbee on a grassy hill with the hills behind. So the red stuff is all uh, not uh, correct and not entailed uh, by the input image in this case, as well as the more high-level coarse-grained caption which hallucinates gray suit and sunglasses. And then all the way to task like text to image generation, where given a text uh, prompt, the job is to generate images. And we'll see at the end of the talk that even basic things like a small red block standing to the left of a large green block or a stack of three cubes with a certain order uh, is very hard uh, for these models. So basically, the, uh, the output image in this case is not being faithful uh, to the information uh, in the input text. So the first part of the talk, we'll uh, discuss this NACL 2022 paper, uh, where we basically showed how to holistically incorporate factuality information uh, into large scale pre-trained models for summarization. Uh, so again, the motivation is, as I just mentioned, that we basically don't want the summary to contain entities not present in the document. In this case, the red parts are not uh, present in the input document. Uh, so previous work has done a lot of good work in terms of uh, incorporating and discussing factuality inside the fine tuning and post processing aspects uh, of this pipeline. Uh, but what we wanted to do here is address the goal of holistically adding uh, factuality inside the pre training and fine tuning setup. So I'll give you a brief overview of first the pre training side and then the fine tuning side. So for pre training, uh, Zhang 2019. Uh, created this pre-training objective for pre-trained summarization models, which was called gap sentence generation. So the idea here is that so I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume that the audience is aware of what pre-training objectives means here. But the basic idea is you try to do self-supervision here, right? You try to take a lot of unlabeled data and create a task like mass language modeling, right? For general large scale language models where you create certain gaps and fill in the blank kind of task uh, on unlabeled text and the model's job is to fill in the blanks, right? Uh, predict the mask text. So for summarization, a similar pre-training objective was gap sentence generation, where you would do the simple idea of finding one sentence in the input document that could be treated as a summary of the rest of the sentences by using something like a Rouge score, which is a metric, like a, con say, like a content uh, evaluation metric for summarization. So that sentence with the highest Rouge score with respect to the rest of the sentences would become the pseudo summary and the rest of the document with a mask in that sentence's location would become the pseudo document. And then you would get 100,000 to a million such examples, right, to be able to uh, do your pre training uh, task. Uh, but so the first thing we sort of fixed here is that the selected sentence is only being chosen based on a Rouge style uh, content similarity metric. But it may not be factual with respect to the rest of the document. So the simple thing you can do is that you also incorporate, like by, when choosing the sentence, you don't just check for rouge, but also a factuality style metric, which is related to entailment style uh, checks. And then the improved pseudo summaries uh, would be used for pre training. So basically, the summaries you're selecting important and factual sentences as the pseudo summary here. And then you can simulate the summarization task by transforming text into these pseudo document and summary pairs, which is the right side here. Then on the fine tuning side, what you do is you have three issues that you're fixing in terms of uh, hallucinations and faithfulness. Uh, so these are known as the three modules that we created, connector, corrector, and contrastor. So let's briefly go one by one uh, into what each of these does. So the connector's job is very simple. It's basically fixing a mismatch 
between the pre-training and the fine-tuning side. Uh, because the mask token that's being used during pre-training that I just discussed is not at all uh, present in the fine-tuning setup, which is where you take a downstream smaller data set uh, and you try to uh, fine-tune the pre-trained model uh, to do well on a downstream task. So what the simple fix you can do is you insert the mask token also into the input document of this downstream data set that you're fine tuning on. And in some sense, as I mentioned on the slide, this simulates uh, what the model uh, what the model expects during pre-training, right? So it can be seen as a form of prompting, which helps us to elicit the factuality knowledge that was present in the pre-trained model based on the, uh, the uh, sentence gap sentence generation uh, task that we just showed. The connector's job is a little bit different. So, uh, so the, the connector is fixing the input side. The corrector is fixing the output. So a lot of the downstream data sets that you fine tune on in summarization uh, themselves have hallucinating entities, unfaithful entities. Uh, so what you want to do is you want to either replace some of these unfaithful entities with similar entities that are present in the document, which makes it faithful to the input document, or you can just remove these entities but then it creates these ungrammatical holes. So the simple thing you can do is a combination of these where you can first replace the unfaithful entities with the closest entity in the document. So Mikhail Arteta can be replaced with Arteta because that part is not hallucinated that's present in the input summary, input document. And then uh, the remaining unfaithful or unpresent or hallucinated entities can be removed. And then lastly, the contrastor tries to improve the training side with more interesting negative examples for the model to learn from, right? So think of a very basic max margin setup where you want the model to be able to bring closer the positive pair and bring further the negative pair. But in this case, you also want the negative examples to be strong enough and tricky enough for the model to learn from, not just basic random pairing. So in this case, what you can do is you can have both intrinsic and extrinsic uh, negative samples. For intrinsic, you can replace one of the entities with another entity in the same document. So in this case, uh, Arteta can be replaced with Manuel Pellegrini. And then an extrinsic means that instead of using entities from the same document, you actually bring in wrong entities from another document in the same data set. So that's basically a short summary of the pre-training and fine-tuning faithfulness improvements. Uh, so these three modules fix the input, uh, the output, and then the training using contrastive learning. And then I'll I think I already lost uh, five minutes with the slideshow. So I, I skip some of the results, but basically the idea is that you see with fact Pegasus, you see a lot of improvements in factuality metrics without losing much on the root side. So this is a human evaluation version of it where Pegasus is the baseline, which fact Pegasus dev builds on. So it gets around 12% improvement in factuality while maintaining the same informativeness. Uh, and the important thing here is you don't want to have a shortcut where you're gaining factuality just by being less informative, right? Which means that if you don't even output much information, if I speak less, right, uh, there's smaller chance of me being wrong. So that's the basic idea. So this is something that is important to study in this topic where you don't want to have higher factuality just by having uh, much lesser informative summaries. You need a balance of both. Uh, there's also some zero shot results in the paper where uh, because of this uh, connector that we added, you can actually do much better uh, on zero shot setups where you don't even have uh, a fine tuning data set, you just directly evaluate on a downstream task. And then another trade off that's really important in this work is that you don't want to increase factuality by just being less abstractive, which means by just being more extractive and just by copying things more from the document, right? You still want to maintain rewriting and abstractiveness uh, for use of space better. Uh, so this graph shows that compared to a lot of the previous work, fact Pegasus is actually above this curve of trade-off where it's being factual without just by being less abstractive. Uh, then, uh, yeah, I, I, I'll take questions, I guess, at the end. So I'll move to the next part of the talk, which is the evaluation side. So in terms of the evaluation of uh, factuality in language generation, uh, I'll cover two aspects here. One is this paper from MNLP21, where we tried to study uh, if there's a way to automate some of these metrics for summarization, but also is there a way to balance uh, automation and uh, human annotations, right? What's the right place to not over automate? So just to give a brief uh, 
motivation here. The idea is that you want to be able to have human evaluation, which is reliable, but its problem is that it's expensive and non-reproducible or shareable across papers most of the time. Uh, whereas, because you cannot have the exact same turkers or the exact same, uh, I mean, you should, you can, you can have uh, like a lot of our papers and other papers. I share their instructions for evaluation, but it's still non-reproducible in many settings. But uh, automatic evaluation has the opposite trade-off. It's low cost, fast, and reproducible, but not always reliable, as a lot of work has shown. So, in order to look for a trade-off, first let's look at light pyramid, which the basic idea of uh, this work. Uh, and also the original pyramid work before that was that when you get references uh, for a summary, uh, for, for like of, of some different summaries written by humans, an expert basically breaks them into these semantic content units, which are these triples of information in a summary. And then light pyramid, what it is, does is instead of merging and weighting these skews, uh, you just basically list all of these skews present in the summary. So these can be small triples like, uh, Mohit went to the market and then also uh, the market was three miles away. So different small pieces of information that the summaries are broken into across all references written by uh, the annotators. And then the output summary comes in from the model and another expert or in light pyramids case, a Turker can just check whether all of these reference cues were contained in the summary or not. So present or not present is the basic task. And then the light pyramid score is just the how many skews were present in the model summary that becomes the light pyramid score for that summary. So light square pyramid uh, in our work, the first level of automation, which is semi-automatic, uh, said that this presence kind of uh, task by a Turker or an expert would be replaced by an entailment model where the summary is the input. Uh, one input and the skews one by one are the other input and you're checking whether the each of the skews is entailed by the summary the model summary and so the entailment versus non-entailment becomes the presence uh, task and then the second level of automation in light cube pyramid discussed that even for the expert here which is checking how to break multiple human summaries into skews can be used something like semantic role labeling Right. Uh, so can we use a more semantic task here to be able to break uh, these into something called semantic triplets, which is skews. Uh, and the one example here is that if this is the input uh, summary written by an annotator, you can basically take each verb and then each triplet becomes one argument before it. Right. The argument before it and one argument after it one by one creates each triple. So Catherine Nevin was allowed out. Catherine Nevin was allowed despite being in jail. Uh, Catherine Nevin being jailed for life. So you create each of these skews and then you also connect to co-reference. So 62 year old becomes Catherine Nevin. So 62 year old was seen on a bus. So you also get it from the other sentences. And then lastly, you add a stew for the co-reference. Catherine Nevin is 62 year old, right? The co-reference stew. So this basically creates light cubed pyramid, which is fully automated, right? Where both the parts of the experts or the humans can be replaced by NLI and semantic role labeling. And then the last part of the paper was light two point experiment where we have this shifting sort of scale of how much automation you should do. And this was based on this active learning style idea that you should not blindly just replace all stew, all skews with stews, uh, just because you want full automation, right? You should do it only when the sentence is good enough to be represented by semantic row labels. So this is where we used a regressor style predictor to predict the easiness of a sentence to be handled or represented by semantic role labels or stews based on different kinds of 60 or 70 features of the sentence. Its length, its syntactic tree depth, the different kinds of syntactic elements in the sentence and so on. So this helps you automatically decide which parts of the sentences should be converted to SRL and which uh, using like getting stews versus which ones should still be annotated by experts as cues. So I'll not be able to go into the result details, but the summary here, if you read the paper, was that uh, light cube pyramid gets one of the best human correlations in terms of meta evaluation benchmarks that check the quality of metrics. And then light cube pyramid, which is fully automated, is also getting pretty high correlations, uh, especially after fine tuning. And then light two point X pyramid is this balance where it shows that you can actually reduce the effort by X percent without lo by losing le much less than X percent on the correlations uh, of the metric quality side. So uh, in interest of time, uh, let me move on. So the second part of the evaluation 
for factuality is something going even more beyond semantic row labels. So here we go into semantic graph representations using AMR. And the idea is that we want to better identify factual errors and abstract meaning representation graphs are the one of the good ways to do that, right? And this is important because AMR from Banarescu 2013, it helps us encode core logical concepts and as well as explicitly model relations. But the idea is that it's able to ignore syntactic variations in the text, right? It's able to look at semantic information instead of syntactic variations. And more importantly, it's not looking at independent dependencies or independent relations, right? It's able to capture the global uh, information right in the sentence and global relations as opposed to individual independent relations between entities. So what we did here is AMR basically can capture content with similar meaning by representing it with similar AMR graphs. But if it has some subtle meaning differences where the input might be saying considering something, whereas the summary thinks that that has already happened, not just being considered, it can actually capture these important differences uh, through its AMR structure. And the model basically uses a graph encoder to take these sentence level summary and document AMR graphs. Then it encodes them using structured adapters, uh, which only allows less than 2% uh, parameters to be updated. And then on a Frank uh, called a uh, meta evaluation benchmark called Frank, which basically checks correlations of metric judge, uh, rankings with human rankings for factuality metrics. Uh, fact graph is able to get uh, improved correlations compared to other factuality metrics on this benchmark, especially being good at something called extrinsic hall hallucinations, which means where information is being incorrect, unfaithful information is being brought in from external text, uh, external like uh, uh, information outside the document, external knowledge. Okay, so in the last uh, one minute each, I'll just briefly mention the two uh, multimodal connections. So uh, EMNLP 2022, we basically tried to show how we can capture factuality as a metric for a new task of relatively new task of multimodal summarization, where the idea is that you are both given some images in a data set like Wikihow, as well as a document, and you have to generate a summary. So what you can do is you can basically use different kinds of language-based similarity metrics versus image and text-based similarity metrics like clip score versus word score. And then you can try different methods of learning the best combination uh, so as to get the overall metric that checks both image summary faithfulness as well as document summary faithfulness. So that because in this case, the summary has to be faithful both to the image and the document. And then for text to image generation, uh, my one minute uh, summary here is that I'm sure you have been bombarded by all these automatically generated, very interesting looking uh, fake images around you, right? Model generated, even things like astronauts on a horse is pretty old news now. Uh, so these are all great, right? Like there's astronauts riding horses, they can do it in Andy Warhol style and with pencil drawing styles and so on. Uh, but as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, even very basic compositionality uh, skills of being able to put something to the left of something else or stacking something in a certain order is very hard for uh, current models. But the problem was that there's no evaluation uh, because most of the current models, uh, there's also big issues on the ethics side that's covered in our paper called DALI eval. Uh, for example, photo of a lawyer versus nurse, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, but I'll skip that for this purpose of this talk uh, in terms of faithfulness. But the problem here that we discussed in this uh, DALI eval paper is that there is no existing metric that actually tries to quantitatively uh, check the uh, skill, the compositionality skill and faithfulness issue. Most existing metrics basically just do things like do some sort of image similarity between the generated image and the original image, or try to see whether given lots of captions, can the generated image retrieve the correct caption instead of a wrong caption or vice versa, right? But these are all very high level shallow metrics because they're not really checking for something like left to the right of, right? Because the features of the image will still be very similar if you generate the wrong ordering. So what we did is we basically had something called visual reasoning skills, uh, where we have very specific quantitative metrics for things like object recognition. So if I'm saying generate a photo of two dogs, then something like object counting, right? That the model should make sure that I have generated two objects that are both dogs. And if I'm saying a cat is left to a dog, the generated image should have a cat and a dog, but the cat's counting box should be to the uh, left of the box for the dog. 
So the way we do this is we have a data set called paint skills, which is a very sort of high resolution 3D simulator based data set, which gives you a rendering option for creating all kinds of different combinations of spatial skills. And then you fine tune your, so it's basically can generate all these kinds of things that a model cannot uh, just take shortcuts on, right? Because it actually gives you full control to generate configurations that the model does not know about, right? In any, by, by over memorizing an existing data set. And then you can run models like stable diffusion or main DALI or DALI small and ask them to generate these different configurations like four potted plants in the image or airplane is above a suitcase because it's fine tuned. So you fine tune these models on this paint skills data set. And then you can uh, do all these kinds of metrics of how uh, good they were in things like object versus counting versus spatial. And as you can see, most of these models are still very bad uh, at a lot of these visual reasoning skills. So yeah, I'll conclude here, uh, just uh, some sort of fodder for, uh, so Murray and Asim, is it okay if I just conclude this slide? Since, yes, uh, please go ahead, just conclude. Yeah, so, yeah, so some fodder for uh, the panel and future thoughts is, uh, uh, like I said, factuality and hallucination control, right, is we have made some good progress in the community, uh, uh, but this is something that still needs a lot of work and is very challenging. Especially now, even more, right? Because these pre-trained models are surrounding us uh, from everywhere, and these are going to get more and more used versus misused uh, in downstream applications. So the usability and the factuality of these models is really important for most of these applications. Uh, things like education or uh, legal document understanding and many, uh, many applications. Especially becomes important, right, for these pre-trained models, which are uh, trained on billions of unclean uh, documents, right, where we do not even know the quality of the input data, as I showed in some of my slides. Uh, the second part of the talk should, should make us think uh, that the balance of faithfulness uh, is not very well studied with abstractiveness and informativeness, right? You don't want to have shortcuts of faithfulness by just uh, either copying more information or just by saying less information. But the copying thing is not also a complete story on its own. We actually had a follow-up work where we showed that people might think that extractive summarization where you just copy from the document is always faithful, but no, it can have a lot of issues like discourse errors or missing co-reference where you accidentally delete a sentence in the middle, which creates a completely opposite sentiment. Maybe the document is saying something positive, but the summary sounds negative. Uh, and then the balance of uh, human versus automated evaluation, right? So active learning is just one example I discussed but it's important to think of what other solutions could be uh, existing here. And then in the topic of this workshop, right, structured semantic representations and neurosymbolic approaches using things like AMR graphs or semantic role labeling, right, uh, does get us uh, pretty far. But then the bigger problem is how do we make sure that they are high quality, uh, right, graphs for especially for new domains and languages or low resource uh, domains and languages. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I'll skip some of the other ones because I was not able to uh, discuss the slides on these. But a lot of these things uh, that people forget to discuss is that when you bring in automation into these metrics, right, you need to make sure that you're also checking for out of domain generalization. Like the NLI model you see in our paper, uh, like we have shown how you can actually make it better for the domains where the, the, on which the NLI model is not trained on. And then hopefully I gave you some initial excitement about also factuality uh, playing a very important role in multimodal tasks. Thanks. All right.